weeks, the seasoned fighters of Eighth Army scoured the countryside, inflicting fantastic losses on the retreating Reds. On March 7th, the enemy's main stronghold east of Seoul was smashed. The next step would be Seoul itself. On March 15th, Korean troops entered the city. They found a few old people and children. The communists had fled. Across the full width of the peninsula, the enemy was retreating. Figure this one out. We're chasing them and they're leaving surrender posters behind for us. In April, General James Van Fleet arrived to take over the 8th Army. A canny tactician, he replaced General Ridgway, who had been appointed Supreme Commander when General MacArthur returned to the United States. Within a week of Big Jim's arrival, he was fighting off the Communist Spring Offensive. The Communists concentrated their barrages on the East Central Front, probing for a weak spot into which to pour their tides of humanity. UN forces were needed to slow the enemy's human wave tactics. We had a routine. Hold till the ammo ran out, then pull back and call for an airstrike. weather grounded the Air Force, units north of Seoul were forced back across the Imjin River. Seoul was fortified against the coming second wave of the Red Offensive. Van Fleet was determined not to lose the capital city again. Whoever said the worst part about war is the waiting was right. Still, we didn't have to wait long. Every road, every valley approach had been zeroed in beforehand. The enemy lost thousands of men breaking through the curtain of fire then faltered and lost his advantage. As the enemy turned once again to retreat northward, Van Fleet followed with mobile firepower. By June 2nd, we had recrossed the parallel. The enemy had spent 200,000 men, a third of his entire force, and gained nothing but the knowledge that numbers were not enough. Operation Killer continued without let-up. Within a month, truce feelers materialized into the first meetings at the red-held city of Quezon. World peace hopes soared. The chief UN negotiator was Vice Admiral Turner Joy. His opposite number, North Korea's chain-smoking General Nam Il. Pessimistic correspondents predicted the talks would drag on for as long as six weeks. With the opening of truce negotiations, the line became stabilized. With minor fluctuations, it would remain much the same until the ceasefire. New battle techniques were developed. In the eastern sector, a marine battalion made history by securing a hill in no man's land from the air by helicopter. The first wave landed a shore party which would clear the small landing area needed. In a matter of minutes, the first copter load of aerial cavalry was arriving. Fully equipped, fresh, ready for action. By using copters, the Marines secured commanding high ground, 
within enemy territory without having to fight their way to it. Copters supplied the operation and evacuated troops at its completion, opening the way to a new concept in tactical troop movement. In Kaesong, the truce talks were already bogging down, deadlocked over the issue of a ceasefire line. We didn't like the setup in Kaesong. It was the enemy's home ground and he knew it. Now Mill used the talks as a propaganda loudspeaker. The so-called neutral area was crawling with armed red soldiers. We broke off the talks. Air Force saber jets ruled the skies. At this point in the fighting, the UN had lost less than 80 aircraft. Verified kills on communist planes numbered 510. tiny farming village of Panmunjom. The UN delegates offered a compromise. They would accept the communist proposed ceasefire along the present battle lines if all other problems could be ironed out within 30 days. If not, all bets were off. The war virtually stopped, except for the constant booming of artillery. deadline was passed, the war was on again. The deadlock issue now was the right of prisoners to free choice in the matter of repatriation. Both sides were adamant. Meantime, across the breadth of Korea were fought the bloody hill battles, things not difficult nor pleasant to remember. Slopes were laid bare, pitted almost beyond believing. This war had reverted to the style of 1914, opposing trench lines facing one another, night patrolling and local attacks across the no man's land which lay between. It was costly, but there was no clear way out. The big break came in April 1953 with little switch. Stalin had died in March and Malenkov had taken over. Immediately, he launched his worldwide peace offensive, and the Chinese agreed unconditionally to General Clark's standing proposal to exchange sick and wounded prisoners. The exchange went smoothly, and truce talks were resumed. Encouraged, the world listened for news of the final signing that would mean ceasefire in Korea. It came on July 27, 1953. 
While the communists signed at Panmunjom, General Clark, in ceremonies at the UN base camp in Munsan, signed six copies of the document which would end the bloodshed. There was excitement, but little rejoicing. We have stopped the shooting. That means much to the fighting men and their families. And it will allow some of the grievous wounds of Korea to heal. Therefore, I am thankful. The task now is to put the ceasefire agreement into full effect and get down to working out an enduring settlement of the Korean problem. I cannot find it in me to exult in this hour. Rather, it is a time for prayer that we may succeed in our difficult endeavor to turn this armistice to the advantage of mankind. In accordance with the truce agreement, the opposing forces now pulled back from one another. The open ground left between was to become the demilitarized zone, or DMZ. Big Switch began on August 5th. Some 13,000 UN prisoners returned, most of them South Korean and American. In Big Switch, communism received a telling blow. Two-thirds of the captured Chinese refused repatriation, and 35,000 North Koreans decided to stay in South Korea. Among the returning Americans was General William Dean, captured in 1950 as he led his 25th division in the defense of Taejon. Today, Korea is still divided, but the conflict was not wasted. It called the Kremlin's bluff in the Far East. It more than restored the violated border and left the Republic of Korea with the strongest free army in the Far East. It is true that the price of existence for this young republic for some time to come will be constant vigilance. In that, Korea and the rest of the free nations are in the same boat. <laughs>